Good evening. Welcome to part two of uh, this series on uh, genetic algorithms and uh, more generally software development with R. Uh, as I said last time, this is not really about genetic algorithms as such. I just wanted to try to write some code that uh, took some time to run. So a genetic algorithm is a good candidate for that. And I would like to, the idea would be to, first of all, what I did now is writing it using tidyverse functions and principles. So today we're going to see the second and probably as well the third function in, um, in on, on the list. Uh, last time we saw the first function which in, initializes a random population of uh, solutions. And then I would like to rewrite this same code using uh, more base R. I might use one or the other diverse functions, but the goal would be really to just use base R and then compare the speed of those implementations. And then what I would really like to do would be to rewrite everything in Julia, which is a language that I've been uh, kind of uh, following for some time, but not never really um, writing any serious code on it, just kind of tr testing it out. And it's supposedly very fast. So I would like to rewrite everything using Julia, also to document the process, how difficult it was for uh, an R user that, like myself, has been using R for 13 years, 13 years now, um, how difficult it is to, to switch to Julia, and then compare the, uh, the speed. Well, tonight we're going to look at the second function, evaluate candidates. So this function will evaluate the um, solutions that were randomly generated by the first function called initial population. So just a quick reminder, the goal is to write a genetic algorithm to um, optimize a function that looks like this. So this is the uh, stalagmite function. Uh, when, when you Google genetic algorithm from scratch or things like that, you very often find the blogs that discuss this function. And it, it is interesting because this would be quite difficult to optimize using uh, some hill climbing type of algorithm. So a genetic algorithm here uh, would work well. Uh, I also have some other functions that uh, are also uh, that also kind of look like that, but that's not important for what we're doing today. The idea is to generate a random population of solutions and then see which work well, and then have these solutions reproduce and build new solutions. So the second part of it, so the first part was building uh, a population of random solutions, which was discussed last time. So we'll link it in the description. Now the second step is to evaluate these candidates. So here on my terminal, maybe maybe let me um, maybe let me zoom zoom in a little bit uh, because I think that you might need it. Yeah, that should be okay. Um, so this is my uh, my random population over here. So this stalagmite two is my function. So we can take a look a look at it. Looks like this. That's the code. Um, it needs default parameters. So this I discussed last time, very important for um, for the function in its population. It's basically to have the dimension of the problem. And then uh, the idea is now, okay, how well do this function, how well do these random solutions work? So the second step is to use evaluate candidates. So evaluate, uh, I didn't run it yet. So maybe let me just, and then let's see. So I first initialize a population that needs to work on my stalagmite2 function. And now I evaluate my candidates. Uh, and I need the objective function needs to be the stalagmite. And the initial population is, well, what I've just did. So I put the dot as a placeholder. The dot is, um, is just a shorthand to, to tell R that you want the output of initial population to uh, be placed uh, instead of the dot, right? So if I do that, uh, could not find function on group. Okay, so this you see is already a problem. So my th these functions are in a script that I wrote. I should put them in a package, and maybe I will do that to avoid these kind of issues. So I need to manually load the tidyverse, but then it works. So I get a new column called score, which scores the uh, solutions. The idea here is to maximize the function. So you see that um, these are probably not great. This one, well, the maximum is at one. Uh, so this one is uh, 0.3, so it's not great. 
uh, it's not great, but uh, that's that's how it is. So these are totally random. So you score them. So this is relatively easy to do. Well, yes and no. It looks easy, but it's a bit tricky because this is typically um, a, a situation. So I made a video on row-based workflows, which I will also link. And in this video, this video explains um, how to do something like that. So how to compute over rows. So what I want is to have my uh, these two uh, these two values to be mapped inside of the stalagmite function, right? So let's, let me pull it up once more time. So this x1 here, I want it to go there. This x2 here, I want it to go there, and I want to do that on a per row basis. Okay. Um, now, here, I only have two, two variables. So, of course, if you're doing that just for this specific function, it's not very complicated. You can literally just write, uh, you know, you can write something like uh, uh, mutate stalagmite 2, and then you just write, uh, you know, x. So something like that should work. Something like that should work, or, uh, or a variation of that. But this is when you know beforehand what you the type of function that you're working with or the fun or how many arguments that function has but if you want to write something that is general ge ge general general so that works on any functions then you need to 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 you, you can't hard code the variables that you want to use and this is why it was a bit more complicated than uh, than i first expected and than you might first expect that's why i'm using here this row wise function and then I use the C across everything. So again, I won't go in too much into details here because I made a video just on that. So if this confuses you, uh, just you know, click on the video in the, the description below. I also tried other ways of doing that. Um, and uh, I think, so this one would be more uh, this is kind of base R, so you you use apply, okay? Then this cur data thing, this is something that I discovered while doing that. I won't talk about it now because I haven't really grokked it yet, but uh, I will continue exploring that. And once it makes sense, I, I'll probably make a video on it or perhaps a blog post, I don't know. But the idea of cur data, this means current data. So this is a way for apply to know that x is the current data, which is in this case population. So it's a way to kind of reference it again. So this is used a lot in the data.table package. And I think this is quite new uh, in uh, the, uh, the dplyr package. So this is something that I don't think has been available for very long. So again, I, I need to, to wrap my head around that. but. Um, but this works. This works. So this will probably be what I'm going to do for the um, base implementation of this code. Then I try the pmap double. This works as well, but only if I have three or, a function with three or more arguments. So I need three or more columns. And if I have two columns, then I need map two double. And if I only have one, I would need map. So you see, depending on how many arguments I have. I need uh, to use different functions. So this was not, this was not, uh, not, not a good idea to use them because then uh, I would need to use uh, if, if else, so if I have two arguments, then the use map two. If I have three or more, then use pmap, etc. So it's much easier to, to actually use that. Also, another, something important that I did not say last time, this code <laughs> does not work on functions with only one Argument or one parameter, so this does not functions on this does not function on univariate functions, and the reason will come actually in the next function, which I could rewrite, and not this one. I think no, it's in the in the in the crossover one. Uh, I could rewrite this code to also handle functions of one argument, but I uh, for now I didn't I didn't bother. Anyway, I have scored my solutions. Now I just need to select the best ones. So. The way I did this was using this um, select parents function. So I, I, um, I did it in a very simple way that I think is called uh, steady state selection, I think is what they call. Um, so what this does, 
steady state selection, if I understood it correctly, the idea is you first keep the 10 best solutions. Okay, so this is my, my top. So I use slice marks, I order by score, uh, I keep the 10 and I remove the ties because sometimes you have a lot of ties. Uh, so I remove the ties, I just need one. You know, I don't need to have this solution three times. So that's not something I need. Actually, this exact solution I want, but I, I would have a score. Um, even for other solutions, I would have very similar scores. So and they would get selected. So that's not what I want. I also select or I save the bottom 10 um, to remove them completely. So I remove them completely from the population. And then from what remains the others, okay, I just keep again 10 of those. So at first, I only kept the top 10, and it also worked well. Um, but then, you know, I read about the steady state selection, and uh, I thought that maybe keeping in there some other solutions that might not have worked very well could still be interesting, because then I will show you in the next function, you mixed you mixed those solutions, and um, I guess it would bring in a more, more genetic diversity to, to do it this way. Something that uh, really struck me when I was uh, writing this code and reading uh, on the literature is that there doesn't really seem to be one accepted uh, way of doing uh, this. Uh, I read a lot of different uh, papers and, uh, and uh, blog posts and presentations that were written uh, and made available on the, in the internet. And there are many ways, uh, many different ways of doing uh, and writing genetic algorithms. And for each function, for selection, for we will see crossover now, for mutation, etc., there are many, many different ways of doing it. And I am not sure that there is kind of an accepted standard way of, of, of doing this type of thing. So it's, um, I guess it depends a lot also on the types of problem you need to solve uh, on the dimensionality of these problems probably as well. So um, again, don't take this code as a, uh, the um, a perfect code to run whenever you have these problems. And actually, there is a library for, if you want to use genetic algorithms to optimize functions, there is a library available in R. Uh, I, th I think it's simply called GA. Uh, so just use that. It will work 100 times better than, than what I have done here. Again, I, this is just to you know, wrap my head around certain things. Now that I have selected this, what I want to do with that is create new solutions. The way I will create these new solutions, again, probably the simplest way to do in that is by using this uh, crossover function that I wrote, which the key to this function is, um, maybe I, I should show you on, on a smaller data set. Maybe let me just select two functions, uh, two, two, col two columns, and maybe also only uh, some rows, maybe just the heads. So, Imagine that this AM and seal, imagine that that's my X1 and my X2 from before, right? Imagine that that's my, what I have over here. Those are my, my uh, solutions. Um, what I want now is I want them to reproduce. So what I want is, I think this is perhaps a bad example. Oh, well, no, there is, no, okay. There, there will be some, some kids here. Uh, what I want, so I have one six, actually I have it two times. That's not a problem. I have one four. I have 0, 06, 0, 08, and 0, 06 again. What I don't have, I don't have 1, 8, for example. I also don't have 0, 04. So what I want is to now have these solutions generate these two other solutions, so these children. So I want them to generate 0, 06, no, 0, 04, and 1, 8. So there is a very, very handy function uh, called cross df. Uh, I think this one is in probably in per. But let's see. And as you see, this generates all the possible couples um, out of the uh, starting sets. So out of the vectors AM and of the vector SIL. So this generates. So now, of course, I have uh, three times the solution because um, I have over here, I have my original 1616, and then I have this one paired with this six. So this is why there is a third one here. This is because I have the ties and this is why I removed the ties over here. Okay. So this generates uh, my, uh, my, my children now. Uh, and this is what I'm going to do. So I, here I remove the score because I don't need it anymore. And if I would keep it, then I would have a third column 
and it would generate all the solutions with the score, which doesn't make sense, so I remove it. I use cross df, which, I, let's check it, I think is in curl. I think this cross family, yeah. So you have a couple, you have cross, uh, cross two, cross three, etc. So these are differences. So cross df works on a data frame, cross, cross two, and cross three work on uh, vectors. Cross D and cross N, I don't even know, but who cares. Uh, and then I just, so this is again, something that I read. I just add, you know, a, a random a random number to each solution. And then I filter it out if it's very high. So basically I, I remove, randomly I remove solutions with a very low probability. So this is kind of to, again, to imitate, uh, to imitate the, the circle of life. So some uh, good uh, candidates die. That's how it is. So this is again something that you can, a, a hyperparameter you can play with, but uh, it didn't, in this example, didn't really make a difference. So, but w with very low probability, I remove this, um, these solutions. And then I remove this, I, I, I simply remove this probability because I don't need it. So let's take a look at our, uh, at our crossover. So, I just need to call it, and now I have 400, a, popula a population of 400. I had 20 children, so the top 10 and the, the 10 random, right? They made kids, so you see that I have over here always the same x2, and then all the different x1s, and then I have the second x2, all the 20 x1s, etc. Hence why I have 400. Well, I don't exactly, uh, because apparently some got removed due to, with very low probability, some got removed, so... Okay, uh, great. Now I have mutation. So mutation again is something that uh, is important. And again, it's to imitate life, which is, well, you know, you have uh, uh, certain candidates which will get random mutations and they will perhaps get even better. So you got giraffes with very long necks. Those were animals with short necks who got a random mutation which make, made their neck uh, longer and so they could eat leaves that were higher and today we have giraffes so this is the same story but instead of giraffes we have vectors and here the idea is to say that we, again with low probability you add some random noise so again here row wise because I want again to do it by row and here again uh, I add this uh, I add a new column with so the, the why I why I use row wise maybe I should I, and as well why I did it here if you don't have row wise okay and you, if you do mutate prob uh, this you will have for every row the same so you will have just one random um, one random number that will be selected and it will be the same for all rows right so here by using row wise uh, I make sure that I have one different random number for each row, okay? And then again, with uh, with uh, with uh, low probability, okay, I put it at five, but it could be lower, it could be higher, as you want, I add some random noise. Here again, I use a syntax that is quite complex uh, because I need to add this random noise to every column, not just to one, not just to two, and I needed this to be as general as possible. So it needs to work on functions with two arguments, with three arguments, whatever. So the idea is again to say, well, across every column, but probability and noise. Okay, so noise is uh, the noise that I selected and the probability is the probability to get this noise. So I don't, don't want to, to add the noise to, that, to them. So across every column, but these two, use the plus function to dot x and to noise. So this adds, this adds to every column. So that's dot x noise. So now this is not something that I was able to write like this. I, this took some time because I had a lot of trial and error. So this again, if it's something you really don't, don't really get uh, immediately, that's normal. It's quite complicated. But just you know, just using you just copy and paste this code, use it on a small example with empty cars, and uh, hopefully it will make sense. But the idea again is just to say, well, across the columns, okay. So because this will apply this function across the columns, so the dot x, the dot x here, 
is each column. To, to all these columns, apply the plus function. And what I want to add to each column is the noise. Okay, And this, again, uh, creates uh, some new functions, uh, some new solutions, sorry. So let's, let's again take a look at mutation. So let's call it. And you see uh, this got the noise because it's negative, which actually will be very bad. So this solution won't, won't work. Uh, but this one got uh, yeah this one got got some noise on it, and then we're almost done. Uh, oh, I've been recording for twenty minutes already, mm, but now I want to go to the end because um, yeah I, I don't really see myself making yet another video just to put it together. Um, so the way I put it together is I wrote this big function called uh, genetic algorithm that. Uh, just uses a while loop. So again, I said last time, this is the first while loop I wrote literally in, I don't know, in five years or something. The idea here is to have um, first a function called one run. So this is a function that is inside this function. I only use it there. This does one run of the genetic algorithm. Basically what I've been doing here manually. This does one run of that. The idea is to say, well, I, I want to save this, right? So this is my, my, my first run. Okay, I do it manually, and I go until I evaluate the candidates again. So I do my mutation, right, and then I evaluate the candidates, and then I pass this to the while loop. Okay, I save this previous run in uh, in a result. I only keep the best the best one. I say that this is the first iteration, and then I pass this to the while loop, um, and then for as long as I have. Uh, steps available for as long as steps is inferior to iteration numbers, which is an argument of my function. Yeah, I have it at 10, but of course you could put it at 500. This is going to run, so I, I increment step, of course. I This run is, well, one run, so my function takes as an argument the previous run, and I add a colon with the, num the iteration number. And then I this this you know just keeps this just keeps running. So here there's not really something that is very very smart. It's really just just running. And actually this is very bad what I did here in a sense because this will not stop. For example, um, if if the solution has not been um, or, yeah if if the solution has not been increased or if there there is no improvement in the solution for like uh, five or ten uh, steps. It just continues, whereas you could program it in a way that, okay, for if for 10 steps you don't have any improvement at all, then you stop, you know, instead of running for, for hours. Um, and that's it. So here there is no, I mean, it's not super easy because there's a lot of things, but it's not also super complex in the sense that I don't use unknown functions like before, this uh, cross DF or this uh, uh, mutate across, etc. So this is more kind of normal code and, uh, and it runs. And it works, so let's let's try. I think I, I showed you last time. I showed you last time uh, what it looks like, but uh, but yeah, it runs. It runs, and um, the idea, of course, is to run that ten times, to run that a uh, hundred times. Uh, so you generate a hundred random populations, and and you let them evolve. For some time, and then you, you hopefully one of them would have converged to the solution. Now here we have some interesting stuff because we have here some very close solutions. And the, as I said, the maximum is one. Um, so we have here some some pretty cool population here. So this actually you could even re rewrite the code to uh, start using that uh, as your starting population. So when and you let it run. So actually, only some minor modifications, I guess, would be needed here uh, in this um, in this genetic algorithm. You could write a new function that would now take this and would go with it to hopefully find the maximum. And actually, as I said last time, um, I did find the maximum using my function, which was over here. And but out of I don't know I, I ran it maybe I don't know a dozen times out of all these times I only found it twice so that's why it's important to really uh, run this uh, in parallel which I will show ne next time I already said last time that I would show you this next time which would be this time but I'm going to show you next time how to run this in parallel so that hopefully you find the solution 
And I will also, I hope I will have, will have time to do that until next time, to um, rewrite this using only base functions. And then I would be really interested in the speed, in how fast they run. I expect the base version to run slightly faster than the tidyverse function because the tidyverse, uh, or rather the implementation that uses tidyverse functions, as, as I said last time, is just, you know, runs on more levels of abstraction. Um, for example, you know, things like, things like this, uh, let me, let me see, yeah, things like that. This is very expressive. But this is, you know, this is, you, you don't see it here, but there's, there's a loop basically inside, I think in a cross, there's probably basically a loop because it needs to loop over functions. Plus, it's row wise, so is you have a loop within a loop, but you don't even see it here. So there's a, some very high levels of abstraction, and this generally costs some, uh, some speed. So I would be interested in seeing that. And then, as I said, hopefully in the future, I will have time to translate this to Julia. So, um, Again, I hope you enjoyed. If you have some questions, uh, leave a comment below and uh, see you next time.